Shabbat Masayim. Perek Lamed Gimel Pasuk Aleph. We'll read through it quickly, and then uh, we'll ask some questions, and then uh, we'll start to explore. Ela Masayim Bnei Yisrael Asher Yatzum Mitzrayim. Meretz Mitzrayim. These are the journeys. This is the itinerary of Bnei Yisrael who left Mitzrayim. Let's see them according to their armies and their legions. Biad Moshe ve'Aharon. Um, under the authority of Moshe and Aaron, Vayichtov Moshe et Motzayihem l'Maseihem. Moshe wrote their departures according to their journeys. Alpi Hashem, by the word of Hashem, inherently ambiguous. We don't know whether what is by the word of Hashem is the fact that they traveled, or what is by the word of Hashem is the fact that Moshe wrote it down. Meaning, when it says at the beginning of the pasuk, Vayichtov Moshe et Motzayihem l'Maseihem, was that Moshe's own initiative, as some of Rashi's say, or was that Exactly what it means when it says in the middle of the pasuk al pi Hashem that vayichtov Moshe al pi Hashem ve'elam asayim lamotzayim and these are their journeys according to their departures vayis umi ram says b'chodesh harishon b'chad misha aser lamachodesh harishon they left Ram says the city of Ramses in the first month on the fifteenth mimachar a pesach the day following Pesach, they left with with uh, with triumphant raised high hands in the sight of all Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim was busy. They didn't uh, they didn't stop Bnei Israel. Why didn't they stop them? Because they were busy burying their firstborn. And against their gods, Hashem had executed judgments. They left Ramses and the camp in Sukkot. They went to Etam at the edge of the desert. They left Etam and they returned to Pihachirot. They left Pihachirot and they traveled through the Yam, through the sea, towards the desert. Notice what short shrift it's giving to what seems to be Kriyat Yam Sufir doesn't make any sort of a big deal about this at all. It just says, Vayavru Yam Hamidbara. They went through the ocean towards the desert. Vayelachu Derav Shaloshet Yamim Bamidbara Eitam Vayachinu B'Mamra. They went for three days in the Midbar of Eitam and camped in Mara. We know what happened there, the bitter water. Vayisumi Mara Vayavo Elima. They traveled to Elim. Uva Elim Shtei Mesrei Enot Mayim Uv Deshivin Torim. Even Elim, they encountered Twelve springs of water and seventy tamar trees, seventy date trees. Uh, they traveled to the Yamsuf. In Rafidim, people didn't have water. They traveled to Sina. It doesn't mention the major event that happened there, which is Matan Torah, and they moved from Sinai to Kivrota Ta'ava to the graves of those who were gripped by uh, by Ta'ava, by desire for uh, for food. What's interesting about this this most recent uh, section of the list, basically from Pasuk uh, Yudet Uh, until Pasuk Lamed Aleph, I believe, uh, none of these are mentioned anywhere else. Meaning those place names are ma- not mentioned. Many of the other names here throughout uh, and b- before that, that section of the list begins and after that section of the list are mentioned elsewhere. In other words, they're mentioned in Shemot as we go through uh, the journey of B'nai Israel. They're mentioned in uh, Vaikra and Bemidbar as we go through the journey. But there's a whole section here from around what I said, uh, Pasuk Yudet, to uh, to pasuk uh, lamed lamed aleph, which is not mentioned anywhere else, and that makes sense, of course, because there's a whole section uh, of their journey that's missing from Bumidbar. In other words, from year two, right after the Korach rebellion, there is radio silence until we catch up with Bnei Israel uh, 
when they uh, when they arrive at uh, when uh, in Pasukutet, basically, when um, when we hear about Paraduman to Matmeit, when Miriam dies, there's the the uh, the disaster of Mayim Riva, uh, and Aaron dies. So until then, we have uh, we have lots of sections, lots of material that's simply missing from the Torah. And the reason why, of course, is because all that stuff is what happened when they were traveling during the 38 years from place to place. Okay. Um... Interestingly, makes note of the fact that, that when they got to Ahor HaHar, Aharon went up the mountain and died. And interesting, even more interesting, is that it mentions that this was in the 40th year after the left of Shrine. There are no other dates in this whole list, not one other date, except at the very beginning when it tells us that B'nai Israel left Mitzrayim on uh, a certain exact date, in the first month, on the 15th of the first month. No dates until now, and it tells us the Shnat HaArbaim. B'chodesh HaMecha Mishim B'echad B'chodesh, and it was in the fifth month on the first day of the month. V'aron ben Shalosh V'esir Mumeach Shnat B'moto B'hor Ahar, Aaron is 123. Uh, okay. Also an interesting thing to note. We hear that the Kanani hear about Israel's approach, but we don't hear about the battle that they had, which was reported earlier. Interesting that it mentions that the Kanani heard that, but doesn't mention anything else. That's where they are now. They're in the plains of Moab, right opposite the uh, where Jordan, uh, where where what's it called, where Yericho is located across the Jericho, across the Jordan, I should say. Uh, okay, and that is the end of the list of places. That's the end of the itinerary. Then the parak begins. The parak continues, I should say, with another short section. Hashem speaks the motion arvot moav and says, you are about to cross the Jordan to Eretz Canaan. You should drive out all of the people who live there from before you. And you should destroy all of their bowing down stones and all of their images to Abedu. And destroy all of their altars. You should drive out all the inhabitants of the land, and then you will live there. I give, I give it to you to inherit it. You should, in short, divide it using a lot, using a goral to your families. The bigger families, the bigger tribes get more, the smaller tribes get less. Uh... According to the lot, that will determine who gets which portion. If you do not drive out the people who live there from before you, the people who remain there will be basically thorns in your eyes and thorns in your sides. The Mepharshim have many uh, interesting suggestions for parallels to these terms throughout Tanakh, Tznenim and Tzikim. But the general sense is that they will be a, a, an annoyance to you, or they will even blind you, thorns in your eyes. And they will, uh, they will oppose you, they will harass you over the land that you are living in. And then I will do to you, Hashem says, what I had planned to do to them. Okay. The next parak, Parak Lamadalad, continues with a description of the borders of Eretz Canaan. So we're definitely into the mode of looking forward, and now we're thinking about Eretz Canaan. Um, but we have some questions that we have to ask before we move on to Eretz Canaan. So here are some of the questions. Look back at Perk Lamed Gimel, Pasuk Aleph and Bet. 
And what you have essentially is a list. It's an itinerary. It's, an itinerary. it's a list of uh, places in uh, in their wanderings and their traveling throughout the desert. And um, the question about that list is, uh, is essentially the following. A list is perfectly characteristic of Sefer Bamidbar. We have many, many lists in Sefer Bamidbar. If you think of some of the lists in Sefer Bamidbar, so the Sefer begins with lists. Uh, in Bamidbar Parakalif, there's a, a census of all of the fighting men of all of the soldiers of each tribe. Uh, a very formalized kind of list. It doesn't, it doesn't just give you the numbers. It gives you a certain formula for how to how to describe each tribe according to their fighting men from 20 to 60. And uh, it says that for each tribe. So it's not only a, a list, but it's a very repetitive, formal, wordy kind of list. And that's characteristic of Sefer Bamidbar. You find the same thing throughout the entire first ten prakim of Sefer Bamidbar as the nation organizes for travel. Uh, and then, Bimidbar Parakut, when they actually begin to move, and it says that they begin to travel for the first time, it gives us a list of who travels, and uh, of what order they're in, and which who is the Nasi of each Shevet, even though we know all, all that already, that is the way that Bimidbar communicates with us. Um, as the Sefer goes further, you find more lists. In Bimidbar Parakut, of course, you find the list of the scouts of the uh, Tarim, which we usually call them Raglim, who go to scout out Eretz Yisrael. Um, in... Where is the... Uh, another characteristic list that we uh, that we know about? Um, in Bamidbar Perak Chavav, there's another census of the soldiers, and the census, of course, arrives at almost exactly the same number as the number in Bamidbar Perak Aleph. Uh, and of course, what that communicates, it's not just a census, it's not just a account, but it's a way of communicating that we've come full circle. In other words, it was necessary to count the first generation because they were preparing to enter Eretz Yisrael. They, uh, they were preparing to battle for Eretz Yisrael. Uh, but their plans fell apart and, uh, and came to nothing, and that generation spent the rest of its life in the desert. The fact that we're now taking a census again of the Midbar Perak tells us that we have rehabilitated the nation. We're now ready to face Eretz Canaan once again. And so we're counting again in preparation for entering Eretz Yisrael. Um, or let's say in Bamidbar Perak Chavchet, there is a Parshat uh, HaMuadim. There is a section on the Chagim. And it specifically tells you the Korbanot to be brought on each Chag. Uh, but it's very list-like. It's very formal and list-like. And especially if you look in Perak Chavchet, when it continues... And it gives you the korbanot for each day of Sukkot. So instead of saying on uh, the first day of Sukkot you bring X number, and the next day you bring one less than that, and the next day you bring one less than that, it tells us each day how many you bring in very wordy sort of uh, formal language. That's very characteristic of Sefer Bamidbar. You find the same thing in Bamidbar Paraklamid Aleph, where it counts the spoils of war with Midian. Uh, B'nai Israel take revenge against Midian for their uh, their plan of tempting us into uh, Giloi Ariot and then Abu using their women. And so Hashem commands Moshe, and Moshe commands the Jewish people to take revenge against Midian. Indeed, we do. We wipe them out. Then we, when we come back with the spoils, so there's a very detailed count of the spoils there. Now is not the time to discuss this, but of course, that count reminds us of the count of all of the materials donated by B'nai Israel in Sefer Shemot for the Mishkan. This is almost a repetition of that. The first generation had their gathering of materials and donation of it to the Mishkan, and then they made the Mishkan. Uh, and the second generation now also has its gathering of materials and donation of them to the Mishkan. So it's a similar communication that uh, by repeating something that the first generation did, that uh, that now we're really ready for the second generation to come in. Uh, now this brings us closer to our section. In the end of last week's Parsha in Paraklam Bet, so we had the uh, the story of God and Ruvain approaching Moshe and asking if, given the fact that they have so much cattle, and that this land is cattle land, the land across the Jordan River from Eretz Yisrael, the land uh, which is today uh, Jordan, mostly, um, their request to receive that instead of their instead of the planned portion that was waiting for them in Eretz Yisrael. So that is in Paraklamid Bet. Moshe grants them that land on the condition that they will dispatch their soldiers to help in Israel fight for uh, for their portion in Eretz Israel. 
and uh, they agree, and of course, meanwhile, are going to leave their families and their possessions in uh, in fortress cities that they built for them. And then we come to Perak Lamed Gimel, which is the travelogue, which is the itinerary, the list that we just read before. Perak Lamed as I mentioned before, is the borders of the land, and then another list, the Nisim, whose job it's going to be to divide the uh, the land. Um, the Sefer ends in Perak Lamed Hay, is that we have a command to give the Levim. The Levim don't receive a portion in Eretz Yisrael, as we heard before, uh, but they are supposed to receive individual cities, so they receive those cities. And also there are the laws of the Rotzach B'Shogeg, the inadvertent murderer, or the negligent murderer, not the purposeful premeditated murderer, but the Rotzach B'Shogeg, and how he is, uh, or she is meant to run to one of the cities of refuge, and uh, that can include, of course, the cities given to the Levim. Finally, the Sefer closes with the uh, the petition of the uncles of the Menot Tzlavchad, in other words, Tzlavchad's brothers, who come with a problem to Moshe. You've given uh, land to our nieces, they say, and now when our nieces marry men from outside of our Shevet, so, of course, the land that they take with them will leave our Shevet, and our our Shevet's land will become smaller, so they receive instructions to uh, to marry their nieces and keep it all within the family. Okay. So, the question that we have about uh, our list in Parak Lamed Gimel is as follows. A list is, is really perfectly characteristic of Sefer Bamidbar, but of all things to list, why list the travels of Bnei Israel? Since we've been following the nation's travels all along, what does summarizing these travels add? Next, not only does the Torah list the stops on the journey for us, but it also informs us that Moshe wrote down the whole list. In other words, it's not just the Torah talking to us directly and telling us this is what Ben Israel did. It's also telling us Moshe wrote down the list. So it sounds like Moshe, not just not just Moshe wrote it down as part of the text of the Torah that is handed down to us, uh, along with everything else, but that Moshe wrote some kind of separate list, uh, and uh, and that the audience for that list wasn't us. The audience for that list was back then. For whom was he writing, and why is it important for us to know that he wrote it? Next, in Psukim Aleph and Bed, why such formal language, includes, including a kind of a chiasmus in the opening, when it says, Eila Mas'e, these are the travels, and then bookended at the end by, Ve'ela Mas'ehem Lamotzehem, at the end of the introduction it says, and these are their travels again, classic kind of chiasmatic bookending, uh, before it even begins listing the places that they traveled. So why the formality? Um, next question. Pasuk Aleph uses the term Mas'e to, uh, to indicate the travels, while Pasuk Bet twice uses the more complex Mas'ehem Lamotzaehem or Motzaehem Lamasaehem. What is the difference and what does Motzaehem mean anyway? Um, in Sukim Aleph and Bet, so if uh, when it says that that Bnei Israel left Mitzrayim biyad uh, Moshe Aaron, it means that uh, that they were under Moshe and Aaron, so then the wine Pasuk Bet doesn't make it sound like the travels took place under the guidance of Hashem, Alpi Hashem, uh, or perhaps Alpi Hashem is referring to not to the uh, to the travels. In other words, that the travel took place at the command of Hashem, but to the writing of these travels right now. Okay. Um, next, and this is, I think, perhaps one of the most critical questions, uh, and it's a question on the whole parak. Why is this list of travels? Why is this itinerary inserted here? between the story of Reuben and Gud's request to settle in Avar Herdain across the Jordan River from Israel, in Paraklamad Bet, why is it between that and Paraklamad Daud, which describes the borders of Eretz Yisrael? In other words, this seems to be a section of, of Sefer Bermudbar which is focused on moving beyond the wandering and traveling stage of the Sefer. And that's why Reuben and Gud are receiving their land in the previous parak in Paraklamad Bet. And then Perak Lamed Daud describes the borders of Eretz Yisrael, so it all fits very nicely. The problem is that smack in the middle is, safe, is Perak Lamed Gimel, and Perak Lamed Gimel sort of brings us back to not looking forward to receiving our land, like Reuben and Gad receiving their land, and then the rest of the people receiving their land and the borders being described, but bring us back into the territory of the, uh, of the travels. It would have made more sense, perhaps, to insert this section, in other words, Perak Lamed Gimel, as soon as the travels ended. And when did the travels end? In Perak Kafbet, Pasuk Aleph when they arrived at their current location, where it says uh, that they arrived in Arvot Moab, in the plains of Moab, al Yardin Yerecho, opposite Yerecho, just at the Jordan. So this, uh, our parak seems to be uh, misplaced. Why is it here? 
Next, Sukim Gimel through Dalit. Why, in an otherwise pretty dry list, does the Torah throw in the, the colorful detail, but seem, seemingly superfluous detail, that leaving, uh, about leaving Egypt, that they left Egypt, okay, that's not superfluous, that's one of their travels, right? But leaving Biyad Ramah, leaving uh, high-handedly, leaving uh, proudly, leaving triumphantly, why is that necessary to include? And Le'enei Kol Mitzrayim, in the sight of all of Egypt, and they were... They were, uh, they were watching us leave, and they couldn't do anything about it, and they were burying their firstborn. All that stuff seems unnecessary here. The reason why, why I make a point of it specifically is because there's so many events that are left out. Matan Torah is left out. Kriyat Yamsuf is pretty much left out. Uh, so many, so many, so many things are left out, so why would this be mentioned? And also, to add to that list, Uve Eloheim Asa Hashem Shvatim, that Hashem had done, had executed judgments against all of their... Gods. So why is that? Uh, why is that included? Why is that important enough? In other words, we're having a uh, a sixty second summary of the entire of all the events that have happened since Yitzhak Mitzrayim uh, from that time until now. So why uh, why mention these uh, highlights of the moment that, that they left Mitzrayim and then skip pretty much everything else until now? Uh, next, why tell us about the twelve springs at Elim? And the seventy date palms that they uh, that they found there. What's the what's the difference now? Um, next, pasuk yud dalid. Why single out the lack of water at Rafidim? This happened many times. They had a lack of water, and other events of similar significance happened. Also, uh, the lack of uh, food, the lack of interesting food, all kinds of different complaints and problems and disasters. We hear nothing about the Korach rebellion. Nothing against the about the Meraglim rebellion. Nothing about Miriam and Aaron's uh, criticizing, not, really none of that stuff. All we hear about here is uh, the, the lack of water at Rufidim, or about the bitter water at Mara, or so many different other things, so why mention this? Next thing which is singled out, which is strange, is in Pasuk Lamed Ched and Lamed Tet, why revisit the death of Aaron? Of all events to single out in the midst of this place listing, why mention the death of Aaron? Why mention his age? Why is that necessary? In other words, we're sort of back into a a sort of very specific storytelling kind of narrative, which tells us where he died and how old he was, and uh, other kinds of details. Why mention here that it took place in the 40th year after leaving Egypt? Ironically, when Aaron actually dies, it doesn't tell us what year it is. We don't know what year it is at that point. We only find out now that it was the 40th year. So not only did it leave it out, the place would have been more logical to put it, but it put it here, which is seemingly not a logical place uh, to put it. Um, and in fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is the, th- the first time that we hear explicitly, explicitly, that 38 years have passed since we were last given a date. Um, okay. Um, next, and this is on the ba- a question about the final section of the parak. The uh, this section, Sukim Nun through Nun Vav, uh, basically delivers a warning to completely drive out the Canaanites and destroy all traces of their religion. Then there's an instruction to divide the land according to population, according to the population of Bnei Israel. And then we come back to a warning that if the Canaanites remain, they will cause trouble for us, and Hashem himself will cause trouble for us, even drive us out. So why is this section, which is connected to the entrance to the land and not to the itinerary that we just read, why is it here? Why is it right after this section? In other words, we have the itinerary, which is all about travel, and then we totally switch modes to prepare to enter Eretz Yisrael, warning about uh, destroying the Canaanites, or driving them out at least, and destroying their their religious uh, traces. Uh, and this little warning, this little section from Nun to Nun Vav, why does it switch from topic A to B and then back to A? In other words, topic A is drive out the Canaanites and destroy their religion. Topic B is divide the land according to, uh, according to uh, your numbers. And then back to topic A. If you don't drive them out, so then there's going to be big trouble for you. So what is the what is the uh, the issue? What is the way that uh, that this is working? Okay. Um, I don't have satisfying answers for all these questions, but uh, perhaps for some, uh, we can arrive at uh, at a little bit of something. The last thing that we hear about as a narrative before 38 years pass is essentially uh, is essentially to be found in um, in B'midbar Parak Yudchet. If we go back for a second we trace the list of disasters 
starting from starting from uh, from Perik Yud Aleph, that's the first time that we find the complaints. Perik Aleph through Yud and Bimidbar are building and organizing and uh, standardizing and counting and uh, getting everything ready, getting everything ready for that triumphant journey into Eretz Yisrael. Bimidbar Perik Yud Aleph sounds the first note of trouble, the begin the, the beginning of the complaints. Moshe quickly becomes demoralized and demands that Hashem relieve him of his duties. Uh, Hashem provides him instead with 70 assistants. In the next parak, parak you'd bet, Moshe and, uh, Miriam and Aaron criticize Moshe, uh, and they are punished. In Parak Yud Gimel and Yud Dawud, we find the Meraglim disaster, where the Meraglim scouts sent to basically advertise how wonderful our Israelis instead come back and dissuade the people from believing in Hashem's promises and entering Eretz Yisrael. Uh, and Hashem, of course, decrees that they lose their, their portion, their opportunity to enter Eretz Yisrael. And uh, after that, in Perak Ted Zion, we have the Korach Rebellion, the terrible aftermath in Perak Zion of the Korach Rebellion, people losing their faith in Moshe Rabbeinu and saying, you're just, uh, you're not out for the good of the Jewish people, you, uh, you've killed us so many times. Uh, and then Perak Yudchet, Clarifies and recasts the roles of the Kohanim and Leviim, especially in the uh, the wake and the aftermath of the the apparent lack of clarity about uh, the role of the Kohanim and the role of the Leviim, which you see in the Korach rebellion. Korach and his uh, brother Leviim not being happy or not being clear on their role and the difference between them and Kohanim. So all that is clarified in a recast in Bamidbar Perak Yudchad. The very next thing that we find is Parah Dumat and uh, the Halachot of Tumat Meit. What is Parah Dumat doing in Bamidbar? It should really be, of course, in Vayikra, as we commented in a previous year. And what is Tumat Meit doing here? In other words, uh, Tumat Meit should have been listed between Vayikra Perak Yud Aleph and uh, Vayikra Perak Tedzayim, which talk about all the different uh, types of Tumat. Uh, the cardinal type of Tumah, which is Tumah Pei, should certainly be there. So the answer that uh, that many suggest is, of course, that this is the Torah's way, as happens throughout Sefer Bamidbar, of delivering a halacha, delivering a mitzvah, which integrates exactly with the narrative. In other words, what's happening is, now death is over. Now a, a, long, uh, a long section, a long uh, period of time, which was characterized basically by death, has come to an end. Perk Yudchet was the last thing that we heard, clarifying and recasting the roles of the Kwanim and Levim. Then 38 years pass, 38 phantom years disappear right down the drain. The next thing Hashem says to us is in Bamidbar, Perk Yudchet, which is, okay, now that the dying has stopped, it doesn't say in the Torah that the dying has stopped, I'm theorizing that, that the dying has now stopped, so Hashem is signifying that in a Bamidbar kind of way, which is, by integrating a new mitzvah into the narrative. Now that the people have stopped dying, so we don't just say, now the people stopped dying, we also give a mitzvah which uh, which integrates in with that narrative element. And so uh, that tells us Parak Yudtet is exactly where the, uh, the Sefer splits into two. That's after the 38 years, in my opinion. And uh, from that point on, we're in the second generation. Now, not exactly in the second generation. There's still a lot of things that have to happen before we're in. Uh, we, we've made that transition to the second generation. So, in Bamidbar Perukaf, we have the death of Miriam and the death of Aaron. Those are two events which, of course, have to happen before the people can enter Eretz Israel, and sort of the baton being passed from one generation to the next. Aaron, the old guard, passing his baton to Eleazar, his son, uh, and uh, and Miriam dying as well. Uh, and then you begin to see events which are transition kind of events. In Bamidbar Perak Hafalaf, you have war. We have war with the people of Canaan. We're not in Canaan yet, but they heard we're coming, and they came to meet us and fight with us. And so we have war with them. We also have war with Sichon and Og, uh, which we don't think of as part of the conquest of Eretz Israel. But when those, when the sections formerly owned by Sichon and Og become the section settled by Reuben Gud and half of Menashe, it turns out, in retrospect, that that was the beginning of the war for Eretz Yisrael. In Bamidbar Perak Chofbet, that actually is the end of the travels, because that is when the Torah comments that we arrive in Arvot Moav. Uh, the Torah takes a quick break for the story of Bilam, the story of Bilam HaRasha, and the end of Perak Chofbet, and then per, uh, Prakim Chaf Gimel and Chaf Dalid. In Perak Chof Hei, uh, we see the uh, the people are not moving anymore. They're in Arvot Moav, and they are visited by the uh, the uh, the Midianite women 
who have plotted at uh, at Bilam's at Bilam's urging to try to uh, to try to lure Bnei Israel into sleeping with them, which of course they're successful at, and then lure us into worshiping Baal Peor, the reaction of uh, Pinchas, and um, so these are all these are all events which happen there before we enter Eretz Yisrael. Um, another transition event happens in Perak Chav Zayin when Yoshua receives his smicha from Moshe Rabbeinu. In other words, uh, Aaron passed the baton to Elazar earlier on. Now Moshe passes the baton to Yoshua, basically. Um, then we have all kinds of different mitzvot, which in uh, various ways are, are related to, uh, to uh, the fact that this is a new generation. In Perak Chavchet, Chavtet, uh, and uh, Lamed. In Perak Lamed Aleph, we bring back the Midian topic, uh, which we picked up, uh, which we left at the end of, uh, which we left at the end of Perak Kaf when we, uh, when we heard about the Midianite women and uh, Pinchas's, uh, Pinchas's zealous reaction in, uh, in that story. Now we have the war with Midian and the counting of the spoils after we beat Midian. And then in Perak Lamed Bet, Paraklam Bed is where God and Ruvain ask to receive their portion outside of Eretz Yisrael in Avar Herodain, in the land conquered from Sichon and Og. The very next parak is the travelogue, is the itinerary, uh, and that's the uh, the parak about which we're asking. Isn't that parak in the wrong place? Where would it have made more sense to put it? So I'm claiming it would have made more sense to put it at... Uh, at uh, the beginning of Perak Chafet, when we arrive at our Vod Moab, that's the end of our journey. So it should have said, now that it's the end of the journey, there's going to be no more traveling. Let's summarize all of the uh, all of the travels. Why didn't the Torah uh, put that there? And what I'd like to suggest is, uh, perhaps it's already uh, obvious what, uh, what I'm going to suggest based on how I'm describing the content of these Perkim, but basically... There are two separate things that need to happen in order for us to enter Eretz Yisrael. Number one is that we need to stop traveling. In other words, we need to we need to get to our destination point. We need to get to the edge of Eretz Yisrael, then we can enter. So if we were just waiting for that point, if we were just waiting for the end of the travels, and then we would give the whole itinerary, so then my initial suggestion of putting it in Perakhov Bet would have made sense. That's when we stop traveling. That's when there are no more places to list. So we could have stopped and said, okay, the travels are over. Let's list all the travels. Let's list all the places. However, the Torah is trying to uh, do more than just uh, mark the end of the travels. This list, like every other list in Sefer Bamidbar, uh, has a narrative function. Just like the halachot in Sefer Bamidbar have a narrative function, they're not just halachot that are given to us. They have to do with the narrative. They're always connected with the narrative, with the story in some way. So these lists are also always connected with the narrative in some way. And so this itinerary is not just telling us, okay, now they stopped traveling, so we can tell you what the all the places were that they went. This narrative, uh, this uh, itinerary is telling us, now the stage of being in the desert is over. The journey is over, not only in terms of the physical journey, but all the different stages that need to be gotten over, that need to be gotten past, that need to be, uh, that need to be uh, transitioned through in order for us to enter Eretz Israel, have successfully been uh, been passed, and so we uh, we've taken our revenge against Midian for what they did for us. That, of course, is something we have to do before we enter Eretz Yisrael. Um, and Gud and Ruvain. Why is Gud and Ruvain before the itineraries? In other words, you would expect that if we're moving on to the stage of of people receiving their lands, the itinerary would be first, right? Finish up with all the travel, then Gud and Ruvain would receive their land. And then we move into Eretz Yisrael. But the Torah wants to do more than that. The Torah is giving us the itinerary as the bookend is closing off the entire pre-Eretz Yisrael section. So Ruvain and Gad, and eventually Chatzis Shevet Menashe, who received their portion outside of Eretz Yisrael, essentially what the Torah is saying, by putting the itinerary after that, is saying, that's all part of the Chutz Laaretz episode. That's all part of the pre-Eretz Yisrael episode. It's true that they got that land. It's true that Moshe agreed to that. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't, not only was it not part of the original plan, it's not something ideal. It's not something that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that should have happened. It's not only not something that we anticipated happening, but it's something that should not have happened. In that sense, it reminds us of a scene much earlier in the Chumash when, 
uh, some other people came out of Mitzrayim. In Breshit, when Abraham comes to Eretz Canaan and quickly finds that there is a famine in the land, he leaves Eretz Yisrael with Lot, and, and of course the rest of, uh, I mentioned Lot because Lot is going to be important in a second. He leaves uh, Eretz Yisrael with Lot, goes down to Mitzrayim, stays in Mitzrayim until he is ejected from Mitzrayim for misleading Paro into thinking that his wife is his sister. And then he comes back to Eretz Canaan. When he comes back to Eretz Canaan, he and Lot... He and Lot settle in Eretz Canaan, and they quickly find that they cannot, with their uh, newly acquired riches from Mitzrayim, they cannot live too close to each other. Their sheep are uh, are competing for the same pastures, and their their shepherds are fighting. So Abraham says, you know what, to preserve our relationship, let's separate a little bit, let's give each other some distance, some space. So you choose first, Abraham says generously to Lot. And it says that Lot looked east, and Lot chose... Uh, Lot chose the area of Sodom. And the reason why he chose that was, it says, that Lot looked at that area, and the whole Kikar Hayardin, the whole plain of the Jordan River, was Kulam Mashke. It, it was all irrigated, it was all lush, it was all fertile. Kigan Hashem Ke Eretz Mitzrayim. Just like Gan Eden, just like Eretz Mitzrayim that he had just come from. And he liked it in Mitzrayim. It was very lush and fertile in Mitzrayim. And now he's come back to the Dust Bowl, to Eretz Canaan, and he looks over to the east and he sees that there is a place, even within Eretz Canaan, which is Mitzrayim-like, where you don't need the rain. And in fact, of course, as we know, where you don't need Hashem. And Lot, thinking only of money, thinking only of prosperity, chooses the Kikar HaYerdain, even though it means that he will have as neighbors the terrible, terrible people of Sodom. And right then and there, the Torah notes, The people of Sodom were evil and sinners to Hashem. That was obvious even then, but Lot didn't care. Lot went through in his lot with them, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, and eventually became just like them. And then it says, after Lot chose to go east and choose Sodom and its environs, it says, Abraham yashav be'eretz kanan. Right, so look at the contrast. Abraham yashav be'eretz kanan, Lot yashav be'are ha'kikar. Lot basically chose the non-kanan part of kanan. Abraham chooses the real kanan part. And the same thing is happening here. For exactly the same reason Reuven and Gad are choosing not to enter Eretz Yisrael, meaning for reasons of financial gain, they say to Moshe, uh, this land over here is Eretz Mekneh, this land is is uh, pasture land, and we have we have all kinds of uh, all kinds of animals that need pasture. Al Tav Yerenu at Ayrdain, don't bring us across the Jordan. We want to stay right here, and uh, and basically that's exactly what uh, that's exactly what Lot did. So in the end, they're not rejected like Lot was rejected. They don't disappear from the destiny of Klai Israel like like Lot did. They don't uh, they don't they don't throw in with evil people like Lot did. But what they did is it seems, is, uh, is being parallel to what Lot did, even though it's, it's, a, it's a notch better, maybe, uh, maybe several notches better, but it's still very troubling. And it's not for nothing that we know that there are three Aram Miklach, three cities of refuge in that area, because there are so many murderers living there. And you get the sense that people there are paying a lot of attention to making a rich living, and perhaps not enough attention to educating their children properly, and, uh, and, and cultivating a good moral and religious life. So, that is all part of the past. That's all part of what is grudgingly granted to people before we move on to Eretz Yisrael. Now that that's finished, that's all part of the journey. Those people are not going to make it to the end of the journey. Reuven, Gad, Chatzi, Sheva, Menashe have opted out of the journey. They've opted out of Eretz Canaan. Now that the journey is over because those uh, who have opted out have been eliminated, Reuven, Gad, and Chatzi, Sheva, Menashe, so they're not out of Kalah Yisrael, but there are out of Eretz Yisrael. So they now will uh, will fade into the background of Sefer Bamidbar. Now is the time that the journey is really over, that it's time to close the chapter, to turn the page, and to move ahead to moving into Eretz Yisrael. And perhaps for that reason, that's why we now have the itinerary. And of the very next thing in Perak Lama Dalad, is the, uh, is the description of the borders of Eretz Yisrael, the Nesim, who will divide the land. Because the point is, now that we've left the people behind us who are not coming to the land, so the journey is really over now, and now we can move forward immediately to the business of receiving, uh, of receiving the land.
Um, okay. We'll, uh, we'll leave it at that for now. I know I asked a lot of other questions that, uh, a lot of other questions that, uh, that we didn't get to. But, uh, we'll have many more opportunities to share Torah to, uh, together. Uh, if you'd like to share some of your thoughts about, uh, about those questions that I asked before or about the questions that I did address, so feel free, uh, to contact me either here in the comments on, uh, this shear or at my, uh, at my email address. You can find that on our website. Shabbat shalom.